thanks for clicking in. We upload videos every week, so be sure to subscribe so that you can receive your encouragement. And as you are listening in, you may feel led to connect with the ministry. So you can check out our description for different ways on how to do so. And you may also sow into our ministry using the various ways that we have to give. Your giving goes to all of the outreaches that we conduct all throughout the month, every month. Now, let's listen in. How many can look back or reminisce over your life and remember a time where you were either bullied or in my case, somebody tried to bully you. <laughs> Give me a hand. One or the other. Notice I put them both in there so you don't feel uncomfortable. All the dudes are like, I ain't never been bullied. But somebody at least tried to bully you at one point. I I'll never forget it was my first day of high school. Now, I had been boxing since I was a little kid. And I was going into a new world. And in this new world, I had no idea that on my first day, I would be so stressed out all day that on my first day, I'd be a little sweaty and truthfully a little nervous. Here I am, this freshman in high school. And on my first day, this guy who was a senior, now a ninth grader, a senior, there's already a huge growth development there. But this wasn't a normal senior. This senior was like 20 years old. He failed multiple times. And, and I'm not even lying, I'm not exaggerating this. If you saw him, the average senior was already big. But he was bigger than the average senior. And if you saw him to this day, I remember his face clearly. His name was Darren, and he looked like Debo. I mean, literally, he may have even been wearing the button up along with it. But this guy looked like Debo, and here I am just walking down the hallway, and I accidentally bump into him, and he slams me into the locker. Now, by nature, being a fighter, my instincts wanted to go wild. But I calmed down because there's a person I feared more than Darren, and that was my father. And so I had to get a hold of my father to make sure that I could proceed with what would take place after school because I'm not no punk. I'm just putting it out there, I'm not a punk. Even in ninth grader, I wasn't a punk. But I ain't gonna lie, the whole day, and I got a hold of my father, he said, take care of business after school. That's how my father was with me. And so uh, after school, the guy there said, I'm gonna meet you across the street. And like I said, I'm not gonna lie. I was this big, he was that big, and there was a little bit of trepidation taking place inside of me all day. And uh, after school came, and he had a big crowd. He was a senior. He was big. All these people came to follow him. And here I am just by myself. And I was like, all right, Lord, we're going to do this. My mom took me to church enough to know I need to pray in some circumstances. <laughs> and so here we go. And I'm not going to lie in the first two minutes because, you know, I've never, even though I could fight as a teenager and I boxed, I was never a bully. But I had this saying, I will never start a fight, but I will surely finish it. And so we, 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 we roll up together, and in the first minute or two, he was literally tossing me around, <laughs> kicking my tail. But I saw something before we started fighting. And I don't promote fighting to any kid in here. But I saw something before we fight, were fighting. The whole time we were walking, he was smoking a cigarette. And as a boxer, I was eyeing that up because I knew that if he was smoking, if I could just survive, he was going to get tired. So I, I let him take it out on me for the first minute or two. And then out of nowhere, true story, this big old guy out of nowhere, two minutes in, says, time out, time out. Now, one of my friends from Cherry Hill had gone with me. 
And I remember Andre yelling over at me. Cause I, you know, I was like, what do I do? I didn't expect him to call timeout. He was like, T, you better move forward. And let's just say that afterwards, it was like a Jesus moment. From that point forward, the fame of James T went throughout the whole high school. But I, I was shocked because this guy called time out in the middle of a fight. Who calls time out in the middle of a fight? And as I've gotten older, I've realized that that would not be my first fight. I'm still fighting to this day. Except I'm not fighting people necessarily with fists. I'm in a fight with hell over my purpose. I'm in, fight, in a fight with hell over my cause. The thing that God brought me into this world to do. The reason, the reason that, and I used to say the reason that my cell outswam millions of other cells <laughs> nine months before November 20th, 1983. But now I've learned that it's actually not that one cell wins the race. It's just that the womb actually, God has made us so strategic that the womb actually chooses which cell it wants. Isn't that crazy to know that you were chosen before you ever made a choice? That, that, that God allowed me to be chosen. Why did God allow me to be chosen? Was it just to come through life and experience the pleasures and the pains of life? That would be torture. But he brought me into this world. He chose me or touched my mother's womb to choose me for a reason. Paul said, I have fought the good fight of faith. I have finished my course. In other words, my whole life was a fight and I never called time out. I finished. I finished. I finished what God gave me, even when it looked like the odds were against me. Your cause is so much bigger than you realize. To every mother, your cause is bigger than your children. To every father, your cause is bigger than your family. Your cause is so big. If your cause was your family, then God would not have said that sometimes you will have to choose your cause over your family. For no one that loves mother or father, sister or brother more than me is worthy of me. Remember, it was Peter that looked at Jesus and said, I have given up everything to follow you. And Jesus said, there's nobody that gave up everything that left house, brother, sister, father, mother, wives, husband for my sake, but shall receive a hundredfold. God says, everything you gave up for me, you're going to get it back. Now, if you give it up for something other than God, you got a problem. He says, but many that are first. This is why you are to never get jealous of where people are now. They may have gotten there before you, but the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Every person over 40 that's been struggling should be getting excited. Every person over 30 that's had a rough upbringing should be excited because God says before it's all said and done, I'm getting ready to switch things. I'm getting ready to reverse things. It's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. But it comes down to choosing your cause. At your core, do you know the thing that God brought you into this world for? Because it is because of that thing 
that you have been under attack your whole life. It is because of that thing your father was never around. It is because of that thing that your mother never really gave you attention. It is because of that thing the enemy tried to take you out with being touched or molested. It is because of that thing that that man cheated on you. It is because of that thing that that woman left you. Have you discovered your thing? Because until you discover your thing, you use your past as an excuse to fail now. But once you discover your thing, you say it was good that I was afflicted. One thing I've learned about really gifted preachers, really gifted musicians, is they are only gifted because they have been tortured. The reason they are so tortured through life is because they, they, they need to have the flu that you have to reach you. Because the antidote that you are going after for your sickness is actually the sickness. So whenever you're drawn to somebody, if you ever had coffee with them, you would find out that somewhere in their life, they intersected with what you were knocked down with. And it gives you an appreciation for them because you realize that if a hundred people are in the room with different issues, they have gone through a hundred different intersections in their life. But until you discover your core, your cause, you'll continue to need therapy over what God gave to fuel you. It is... My cause, my cause. What is your cause? Jesus looked at Pilate with his skin ripped apart. Jesus looked at Pilate with his face unrecognizable. Jesus looked at Pilate after being humiliated and having a crown with three inch thorns pressed into his skull. Jesus looked at Pilate when Pilate was trying to give him a way out. Jesus said, for this end, I came into the world. This is why I was born. For this cause. My cause. That's why you see so many people volunteering here, not getting paychecks, doing this, doing that, in the back with your kids. They're not doing it for their church. They're doing it because they have found their cause. Jesus was able to resist from tapping out because he found his cause. And maybe you don't need to tap out from a cross but maybe you need to tap out from a friend. But you say he's just a friend. (laughs) Maybe you need to tap out from a habit. Maybe you need to tap out from a responsibility. And Jesus is saying the reason I didn't tap out and take the easy road is because I know why I was born. I was born for this blood. I was born for this beating. I was born for this breaking. I was born for these tears. I was born to be hung up high and stretched out wide. I don't want you to stop it because if you stop it, you will mess up the reason I came into the world. Look at the power of finding your cause. And most people say the victory was given on the cross or in the tomb when the stone was rolled away. No, no, no. The victory was given in Gethsemane when Jesus made up in his mind to follow through with his cause even when it went against what he wanted. David, looking at a big old Debo named Goliath, when everybody was telling him how unqualified he was, You know what he focused on? He said, is there not a 
a cause. Whenever you find your cause, your giants become small. The reason your giant is so big right now, and your giant can be sickness, your giant can be loneliness, your giant can, can be unforgiveness, your giant can be anger. The reason your anger or the reason your giant is so major to you is because you have never looked for your cause. For this cause, Paul said, and I'm moving on. I bow my knee to the Father. You know why you never pray on a regular basis? You know why you have never been on your knees in prayer? It's because you've never had a call so big that you didn't know how to pull it off. For this for this cause, I bow my knee to the Father. I realize he's my king because of my cause. God always gives a person a cause. It, it's handed to you when you come into the world. And the challenge of life is finding your cause before you take that last breath. Because God is not gauging you on how you started your life. God is going to gauge you on how you finish your life. For the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. God had sent Israel, the Hebrew people, the Jews, into Babylon for 70 years because they forgot their cause. Their cause was ultimately to be a people that made him look good everywhere, to be a people that made the world want him, to be a people that were peculiar, that were, that were set apart, to, to be a people that were different. And they forgot the mission. They lost focus. They started taking God for granted. So God had to send them into a season where, as the song said, a season where they could be emptied. Babylon. Remember last week we talked about it. How can I sing in Babylon? God put them in a position where they were so empty they lost their song. Have you ever been so empty that you lost your song? And he gave them encouragement through Jeremiah like, I know the thoughts I have for you. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord of hosts. I got an expected, and, and he would raise up heroes like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to stand firm and show them that even in a bad place, God is still with you. Yes. It's important to understand that no matter how bad the place is, God is still with you. And when the 70 years in Babylon expired that Jeremiah prophesied, God pulled him out, and he gave a man named Ezra instructions. And it would be Ezra and Zerubbabel that would begin the process of leading the Hebrew people back to Jerusalem. And with a remnant, they went. Not everybody went, but with a remnant, they went. Some went on the first journey with Zerubbabel. Others would go with Ezra in the second journey. And, and some would even come with Nehemiah on the third journey later on down the road. But eventually, they would get there. They started in the midst of their rubble to rebuild the temple. But then attacks happened. And now... As I try to move forward quickly, you must understand, 
Those 70 years in Babylon were traumatizing. Horrible. Discouraging. Traumatizing. Just because God pulls you out does not mean the past does still not traumatize you. But as we're going to see today, your trauma, God never allows to be an excuse to not follow your calls. I need people to say, well, my last church hurt me. Church hurt is never an excuse for disobedience. So you're going to allow what a church did or even take it back further. You're going to allow what a person did to you at eight years old to ruin the next 30 years of your life. That's way too much power to give an organization, a job, or a person. But they were traumatized. And they were excited to be a part of what God was doing. But then the attacks came. We talked about them last week. And the attacks were triggers, I think. And... They took their eyes off the cause and they started focusing on things that God didn't really care about at the moment because of one attack. Isn't it crazy how the devil, he don't need a lot. Just one attack, a threat, if you want to call it that, that never would have had power over them. One threat would cause them to spiral. And they took their eyes off the prize. They, they said, God, we know you gave us a cause, but we're just going to pause the cause. Pause, we're just going to time out with the fight. You understand. We'll get back to it. But the problem with putting something off is you blink and you look back and it's 30 years and there's been no progress. The Bible says the Lord's work requires haste. So God sends Haggai to talk to them. And actually Haggai and Zechariah will come in and this is why I love the book of Ezra. We're going to see this over the next few weeks. There's, there's so many webs that come out of Ezra. It's a, it's a small book, but there's a bunch of other books that are directly tied to it. There's Zechariah. There's Haggai. There's the book of Esther. There's the book of Nehemiah. All of these books branch out from Ezra. They all take place in the book of Ezra at the same time. And while they're discouraged and while they're trying to Survive. God sends Haggai and Zechariah to them. Next week, we're going to talk about Zechariah and him trying to get their faith up to move mountains. But Haggai comes in. And it says in the book of Haggai, chapter 1, that in the second year of King Darius... On the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty say. These people, not even my people, these people. You know how you talk about your family sometimes? <laughs> these people, these people. They say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Now, this was the sole reason God pulled them out. But they're saying it's not time. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit pause for the cause. We've got other stuff that is big to us, other stuff that is priority to us. We know that God understands because that's what we say. God gets my heart. But look at how much of your heart God gets in verse 3. Look. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Okay, it's not time to build the house. It's not time to serve. It's not time to talk. Gotcha. Is it time for yourselves to be living in paneled houses? Oh, 
This is where it gets tense. He says, it's not time for your calls, but is it time for you to fix your house? Is it time for you to buy a house while the house remains in ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Now, hey, God, give careful thought to your ways. Look at your life. You have planted much, but harvested little. He says, whenever your return doesn't match what's been going out, it should catch your eyes. It, it shouldn't make you get frustrated. It shouldn't make you want to work three or four jobs. It shouldn't make you want to grab overtime. God says, when you look at what you put out is what you get back less. The reason this is a big deal is because God is about seed time and harvest time. If I, if I sow it, the Bible says I should reap it. If I'm not reaping what I sow, then either God lied or I'm doing something wrong. So God just says, really, look at what you've been putting out and look at what's coming back. He says, you eat, but you never have enough. You're, you're never full. You eat with the marriage, but when it comes to love, you're never full. You got a great man, a great woman, but when it comes to intimacy, you're never full. You got enough money and you got the house, but... You're never full. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. And here's where it gets good. You earn wages. You work your tail off. <laughs> Only to put it in a purse with holes in it. That means every week, when it comes to the end of the week, you're saying to yourself always, where'd it go? It's disappearing on me. How many money has ever done a magical act? <laughs> you have all of these, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna put a little bit away, and, and then come Saturday, it's negative $80. And you just let it run on negative to your next paycheck, taking those insufficient fund fees all through the week. Why? Because you're not succeeding, you are surviving. You put it in purses with, with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your, not your work ethic, not, not your job, your ways. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. He had to deal with their life to get their attention. He had to teach them a lesson that when it comes to my cause, when it comes to the thing you were born to do, this is what most people miss. Provision is given to vision. Your vision is tied to the thing you're called to do. Once you figure out your vision, now you know what you need. And God does what? Supplies all of our needs so he's saying rather than panic and rather than put an application for a part-time job rather than do this and rather than do that ra ra rather than get on websites and try to find a man and try to find a woman rather than you know looking for a plan b because plan a is not where it should be rather than do all of that stuff look at your life yeah. 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 examine not his ways, not the kids' ways, but your ways. Because your life is in your hands. This is what God says. Notice, hey, God keeps saying that so the people don't be like, this, is this hey, guy or God? He keeps saying, this is what the Lord, all, every other verse, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber. Build my house so that I may take pleasure 
and be honored. Here it is again, says the Lord. <laughs> he says, if you want your life to change, I need you to go up into the mountains and bring down wood. You're sitting here today because people you probably never met brought and bring timber every week. It, it may not be wood, but it's time, it's treasures, it's talent. It's what it takes to get this church where God wants it to be. It's what it takes to get our outreaches where God wants them to be. As Ursula read earlier, Jesus said it was more blessed to give than to receive. And, and I know that to be true. Because if I have to choose between needing to be on the giving end or the receiving end, I always choose to be on the giving end. I hate how people treat you when they think you need them. There, there's a difference in how you get treated when you have good health insurance and when you have Medicaid. They treat you completely different. They te treat you different at the Social Security Administration than they do when you're pulling $5,000 out of Wells Fargo. Why? Because you're needy and they see that you need them. And whenever you don't have options, people can treat you how they want to treat you. That's a word right there. Look at somebody and say, I do have options. I do have some options now. I'd always rather be on the giving end than the receiving end, but, but being on the giving end is a choice. I choose to do it with little, and God sees that I will still do it with much. If I am not a giver with little, then I can have a million dollars but still be needy. I may not be needy for a good health care provider, but maybe I'm needy for a man or a woman. Maybe I'm, I'm needy for attention. Needy is a mentality. And so he says, what I want in this season is for you to be a giver. I want you to bring wood. It's not about what can you take. One of the worst things about starting a church from scratch, we started this church, as many of you know, from scratch. I mean, scratch, scratch, like throwing a meal together with 15 kids and not knowing what you're putting together but trying to get them full. That kind of scratch is how we started the church. I know about those meals because that's how my mom cooked when I was a kid. It was whatever. I remember eating stuff. I was like, what is this? <laughs> there's peas in this. There's green beans in this. There's some creamy stuff in this. There's some chippy stuff. I don't even know what this is. My mom had a way of just throwing stuff together to fill us up. We lived near the project, so that's what we did. This, 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 this is bigger. God is not trying to have a bunch of stuff thrown together. God is looking for his house to be built. In those early years, the hardest thing for me as a pastor is for people, where it was when people told me they were leaving the church. And it was never because of my, my preaching necessarily, at least they never told me that. But it was always because of something I had no control over. Well, we want to find a church that has a good children's ministry for our kids. Well, I, I don't have it unless people volunteer. It was people saying, I wish there was a live worship team. I'm leaving because there's not a live worship team. And I would hear that kind of stuff from drummers and musicians. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm sorry. The Lord hasn't sent that yet. I don't pay for the Lord's service. If the pastor's not getting a paycheck from the church, you think I'm paying musicians? <laughs> I haven't gotten paid from a church in years. You think I'm going to pay a drummer? I choose to feed people. That's my priority. And God provides for me 
through good people that come into my life. But it was so horrible because people would tell me they were leaving because of things I don't have control over. And the reason it was so hard is not because I didn't have it. It's because they would leave over things that they could do. Well, I went somewhere with a great church, children's ministry. Well, we could be great if you would sign up to help with the kids. We could have a keyboard player if, if you weren't prostituting your gift. I mean, we, we, we could have a drummer if you didn't come in here with high heels and lipstick on. And what happens is, I know I'm crazy. You can get the laugh out. Y'all are picturing the drummer walking up right now looking like that. But it's, it's frustrating because you have big dreams and a big cause. But it's hard to find people that will cut the timber. Because the experience with God was once a week on Sabbath. But God needed people who through the week would cut the wood and bring it. And because they all had things to do, they all had to pause the calls for a season. And what trips me out about people that pause the calls, you don't quit working when you're struggling. You don't quit having sex when you're struggling. Oh, excuse me, I'm just going through a bad season. Can't come into work. The devil's attacking me. Pray for a sister. Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish. I wish. I'm grateful for this corner. They, 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 they keep it going. Why is it that whenever we need to pause, we always pause the calls? And God is saying at some point you have to look at your life and say, I don't like what this looks like. And I need to get an ax out in this season. And I need to start bringing it every week. God is looking for somebody week in and week out that will bring it for him. Look at somebody say, bring it. Bring it. He says, I want to take pleasure. I want to be honored. You expect it much. I know. At 18, at 24, when you walked across that stage, you, you expect it much. When you walked down that aisle with that man or with you expect it much. When you took that internship, you expect it much. But here you are at 40. And you see it turned out to be little. What you brought home, God says, <laughs> I blew it. I blew it. See, you thought you blew it. God says, you didn't blow it. The reason it didn't work is because I blew it. Why? Here it is. Hey, God. Declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains in ruins, and each of you is busy with your own house. Now, the house may not be in rubble here, but we are far from where God wants us to be. Amen. And God says, I didn't call you to a church to sit. I called you to the church to bring timber. Because of this, therefore, the heavens are withheld their due. The earth is cropped. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountain. There's a, there's a famine. The grain of new wine, the olive oil, everything else the ground produces on the people and the livestock. And all the labor of your hands, God says, I have hit the pause on you. <laughs> he says, pause for pause, reaping and sowing. He says, I've hit the pause. 
And whenever God hits a pause, the Bible uses an F word. You ready for it? It's famine. And it says that when the people heard this, their hearts were open. And it says that God stirred. It started with the leader all the way down to the people. God stirred. When, when you stir something, you're not adding nothing. When you, you stir something, it's because that which was once on the top is at the bottom. Um, stir. The, the first shall be last. The last, Paul told Timothy, he said, I, I want to fan, fan the gift in you by the laying on of my hands. He, he, he says, I, I, I want to I stir, the King James says, what's inside of you. Everything you need is in you. The problem is when you pause your calls, God says it may be a time that you need a fresh stir. They had the stuff in them. They just lost their focus. And it's because of the hard season. And God gave them grace. But now it's too long. I shared last week, and I'm bringing this home now. I shared last week how I, some time back, somebody I really cared about, I really loved, they said they'd always be there for me. They said they'd take a bullet for me. All of this kind of stuff. They were my ride or die, all this stuff. They left. And I remember walking, and I, I, I was walking along Tides Point. It's the Under Armour facility now by the water. And I was just walking and clearing my head. And I remember the Lord telling me, don't you ever cry over a person again. Either I'm in control of everything or I'm in control of nothing. And as Job said, the Lord gives. And regardless of who he takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Because what the enemy was trying to get me to do was pause the cause. And I had to make up in my mind that nothing will hit me so bad that I ever pause what God is trying to do. And now, say now, they could handle the good part. As I bring it home, God says in Haggai chapter 2, and I'm going to breeze through this. L listen to this. He says, who of you have left that saw the house in its first glory? How does it look now? Does it seem to you like nothing? But now be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, the son of Joseph, the high priest. Be strong, all of you people of the land, declares the, the Lord, and, and work for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains in you. Do not fear. Move on to verse 9. Quickly, six, I mean, this is what the Lord God Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and what is desired by all nations will come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, declares the Lord. And the glory of this present will be greater than the former house, says the Lord. In this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. Whoo! Here's where it gets good. He says, because you hit the pause button again so that it would play, he says, I am about to shake everything up. I'm about to shake it in a way it's never been shaken before. 
I'm about to shake it in a way where money comes. I'm about to shake it in a way where people come. I'm going to shake your life in a way where love comes back. I'm going to shake your life in such a way that the healing comes in the house. I'm going to shake your family in such a way that the kids come back to Jesus, that the family comes back to Jesus. I'm going to shake it so the money comes. I'm going to shake it so the peace comes. I'm going to shake it so the provision comes. God says, because you hit play, I'm about to shake this thing up. Is anybody ready for your life to shake again? God says everything that's been at the bottom, everything that's been lost, everything the enemy took, I'm about to shake it back into your life. I'm going to shake it so that you know. God says your best is still ahead of you. Your best is not behind you. This is for somebody. This is for some family. God is saying better days are coming. I am going to shake some stuff up. But you got to have the faith to say, God, I will never again pause for the cause. For this cause, I came into the world. For this cause, this cause, I bow my knee to the Father. God is looking for just one person that says, Lord, I want to be a part of the cause. He says once more. And what I love about that is it means he's done it before. Once more. I'm going to do it again, he says. This is why you are to never give up. You are to never quit. No matter what you've done or where you are, God says, if I wanted you dead, you'd be gone. You are here on purpose. You are here on purpose. You are here on purpose. You don't want to have no regrets. You want to be able to look back and say, my family is where I need them to be. You want to look back and say, I've done everything that was there to do. I have no regrets. I am now ready, as Paul said, to be offered. When you look at your life, it is clear that where you are now is remarkable. If a girl had what happened to you happen to her, she would have ended it all a long time ago. If a guy went through what you went through, he wouldn't be in church today. He'd probably be dead or in jail. If a marriage went through what y'all's marriage went through, they would have got divorced a long time ago. You're ready to throw in the towel now? That's so stupid. You're going to blow up your legacy because love left at 40 and you're not giving it a chance to come back at 50? The goal is to live it with everything you have and throw your whole life at God and doing the things that God has placed within you to do. When it's all done, will you be able to look back and say, I did it, God. And when you're in heaven, which we will all be one day, will you have left a legacy on earth that makes you proud? Or will you have left a legacy on earth that makes you say, Lord? You are here because you have a chance to see your best. But it is going to require you to hit that button back to play and let the calls that God gave you move forward. Hey, guys, name means harvest. 
He sent him to preach harvest in a season of famine. He sent him to preach harvest to a people in famine. And today, God has given me a harvest message for a famine person or a famine family. What is the famine that God is trying to fix today, shake today, turn today? But it is going to require you hitting play today.